Hey, hey everybody, what's up? It's Tim Castleman here with another edition of the Two Drink Tim podcast. Thanks so much for paying attention, listening, and actively being involved. What a terrible fucking opening. Really? Actively being involved, Tim? Like, what are you, like a teacher? Like, if you could please sit up and give me your full and undivided attention, I would greatly appreciate it. Like, what a terrible fucking opening. Look, do whatever, right? Maybe you're getting baked while you listen to this. You're driving down the road to a job you can't wait to quit. Maybe you're about to have some fun times with the old lady. Whatever. Let your freak flag fly. You do it how you want to do it. I'm just glad that you're doing it with me, which sounds even worse. I'll work on the open. For next week, that's priority number one, new, more polished open. So where do we begin? First, I guess let's begin with last week's podcast. I was a little nervous for some reason, right? A little nervous, Nelly, uh, about sharing all that information about being open and vulnerable and talking about hating on other people. Um, so let me provide you some cool updates, all right? Um, first, you guys rock, as always. I got a lot of private messages, a few phone calls and texts uh, from people who said, hey, man, I appreciate you being so honest. Uh, I struggle with the same thing that you do, and I really appreciate you kind of sharing that and being able to do that. So um, that's great. That's awesome. That's fantastic. Uh, second thing I need to remember is that, hey, you know what? Some of my friends actually listen to my podcast. Well, who would you be referring to? Well, I would be referring to the good, honorable Dr. Benjamin Atkins, a man who I publicly was talking about how I was uh, upset with. Not even upset, not even hate. I don't even know. My haterade was flag was flying in his general direction, uh, which was t so stupid um, to do. Um, and uh, anyway, he apparently listens to the podcast. So Ben, thanks for listening. Uh, so he heard my diatribe and reached out and was like, bro, like, let's talk. And, you know, I'm really sorry and apologetic. And the thing I want him to understand, uh, that's why I'm stating it publicly. And the thing you understand is it's like, it's nothing about the other person. It was all about internal decisions, right? It wasn't the fact that Rachel was releasing a book or that Ben was releasing a podcast and and all that stuff it was like my reaction to it and uh let me tell you what i did because i told you guys i was going to take some steps so let me tell you what i did right first ben when he reached out i told him hey man not about you 100 percent about me which it is which is good right to, to admit it and let let everyone know like dude we're totally cool i'm just fixing my shit i'm a broken individual i'm working on it we'll get some improvement right so that happened then i decided you know what Instead of trying to kind of keep everything to myself and this is what I do, I'm just going to share open and with love. So what I did was I reached out to Rachel and I said, hey, Rachel, I'm launching a book. Here's what I'm doing. And here's a video and here's everything and I hope you're well. And, you know, when, when we're both done launching our books, let's get together and talk and maybe we can learn from each other. So what does she do? Being the cool down ass chick that she is, right? She sends me back a video because that's how you do it. You don't actually talk. You just communicate either through Voxer or Tinder or video. And sends me back one. She's like, hey, congratulations. It's awesome. Here's what's going on. And we happen to mention a mutual author that we're both fans of that I happen to have an interview with that she was super excited about. And long story short it all fucking worked out right it all worked out it all wrapped itself up in a nice little neat 22 minute bow like a sitcom except that it didn't because it's still a work in progress and it's still something uh that i'm working on but i will tell you okay that it is okay to go and admit that you are flawed in areas okay and i think obviously don't do it at once you know i've been dealing and working on this for probably the last uh, I don't know, 16 months maybe. Um, and I'm still kind of nervous talking about it. And the reason I'm nervous talking about it is I'm worried about the stigma, right? Like people are like, oh my God, you go talk to someone and you're trying to better yourself and be a better human being and husband and, and you know, maybe one day father and friend and uh, boss, like you're an asshole. Why would you want to do that? So I'm worried about that stigma. You know, the people are like, oh my God, there's Tim Kasman. He's a loose cannon, right? Um, and I'm also worried openly and honestly that, you know, some people who are due might try to use that against me, right? So like I get in a fight with someone and they're like, oh yeah, well at least I don't go see, you know, someone about my, to, to maintain proper mental health. And I'll be like, yeah, I know. And you can't see your penis because that's the retort to everything. So um, for whatever reason, it's something that I am coming to be more comfortable sharing. Um, and part of the reason I put it out there is I want people to understand that I have a filter that I see through things. I see things through and it may not be the perfect filter. It's the one I have and it's the one I'm working on changing. So that, you know, it's kind of like, 
Like, I got a friend, he's a great friend, okay? But when he gets mad, he blows up, right? I mean, he just has to blow up and yell and scream and, you know, kick and have his little bitch fit and all that. But once he does that, it's like he's good. He's fine. But you got to let him go through that motion. Well, if I didn't know that about him and he did that, I'd probably be freaked out, right? I'd be like, what the... Now, I don't understand what's going on here. But because I know that about him, when it happens, I'm like, all right, come on, get your little bitch bitch out of the way, blow up, it's me so angry, and then he's fine. So by telling people about that, right, hopefully when I have another glass of stupid-ass haterade, people will be like, ah, you know what, Tim's probably just drinking a little haterade, going through a rough time. Instead of thinking he's a humongous douche and I never want to talk to him or work with him again, maybe I'll cut him some slack. So that's thing number one. And thing number two was just actually going out there and being helpful. Instead of being like, listen, you know, I don't want them to do better than me, right? Um, I want them to do uh, worse than me. Instead of that, it's like, hey, you know what? Here's everything I can do to help you be more successful. Here's everything I know about what you're trying to do. Here's everything I've done. Here's some things you might want to look out for. You know, here's my experience. Let me tell you what's going on right now. And then go from there. You see, that's the difference because then when they get a better result or if they get a better result, then you go back to them and go, man, tell me what it is, right? Tell me what you did. And that's a lot easier to get help and love and support if you've been helpful and loving and supportive instead of being, you know, bitch, bitch, sappy, sappy, bitch, bitch, attack, attack. Like nobody freaking wants that. So anyway, uh, there you go. Uh, that uh, That's the update uh, for that. So what else do I have to share with you? Uh, between this time, uh, last time that we talked, and this time now, I became a best-selling author. Uh, that's pretty freaking cool. I'll take that. I... Um, uh, released our book. It's on Amazon. It's called The Creativity Checklist. The Creativity Checklist. It's a really cool checklist. Uh, this is an honest to God true story. I have spent tens of thousands of dollars getting training from like Dan Kennedy, Gary Halbert, Jay Abraham, right? Clayton Makepeace, John Carlton, um, Frank Kern, Colin Dario, right? I mean, like all of the people, Jason Fladlin, copy. And I love copy. I love copy so much, except I'm terrible at it. Um, but I could never come up with a, a list of questions I wanted to ask myself when I was thinking about doing a problem or service. So I did all this training. I've done personal consulting. I've actually hired people and paid hundreds if not tens of thousands of dollars to get trained and to literally sit down with copywriters and go, help me write this checklist. And we could never get it to work until one drunken night at a bar with my pal, uh, Chase, and the questions just started flowing into my head, like right in the middle of whatever shitty ass beer I was pretending to enjoy, right? And uh, right in the middle of it. So like I grabbed a cocktail waitress uh, and, you know, just sh grabbed her right in the ass because that's the way you get their attention, right? Either that or the boob. You, you choose, right? I'm an ass man. So just, you know, grab the cheek. She turned around, slapped the ever-loving shit out. No. Uh, I said, hey, can I borrow a pen? She gave me a pen and some cocktail napkins. I started writing this thing down. Um, and when I got done with it, I got 11 questions that I asked myself. And I thought, well, that's kind of cool. I was really excited. So I went home, slept off a good drunk, and then uh, got up the next day and put it to use. And the first time I used it with a product idea, uh, I made $10,000. Here's the crazy thing. As I was driving home last night, thinking about this checklist, this is, this is a realistic expectation. I expect that checklist this year alone to probably produce an additional, I'm going to say thirty to $50,000 in business on my bottom line for my business just by using this checklist alone. I mean, I already created 10,000 to, to do another 20,000 by the end of this year. And uh, you know, I'm recording this in August is more than feasible. Hell, it may even be 50. Let's use 50 because I like big round numbers, <laughs> right? Round even numbers like 50. Um, so it's $50,000 this year. Now let's say I decide to do, you know, and stay alive for another 10 years, hopefully many more than that. But let's just say I only make it 10 more years and I keep using this checklist. That means this checklist would be worth a half million dollars to me doing nothing else different in my business except using the checklist. So it's pretty freaking cool. Makes my life tremendously easy to communicate with my staff, my outsourcers, my team, my copywriters, my graphics people. I just use this checklist for freaking anything. In fact, last night, uh, the reason this podcast is late, if you must know, is I was busy filling out creativity checklists for some new products that I'm working on. And I thought 
that I would do that instead of record a podcast about opportunity cost because of the opportunity cost, which I'll talk to you about in a second. So anyway, long story short, I create this checklist um, and I make it uh, into a PDF. I upload it to Amazon, get it done, release it to the list, send an email about it, offer a cool little bonus, and bam, don't you know, we are an Amazon bestseller. Continuing still to this day. So we're seven days uh, away from the last time I mentioned this book, and we're still an Amazon bestseller. Um, so that's pretty freaking remarkable. We're making steady sales and consistent sales long after the initial push. I mean, it's just a win, win, win. So go to Amazon, type in Tim Castleman, or type in the creativity checklist and pick yourself up a copy. I don't know what it is right now. Last time I saw it was $2.99. It may be more, it may be less. It may be $5 billion by the time you listen to this podcast. Who knows? But it was really cool because I became a best-selling author in nonfiction from a book that I completely wrote. Um, so we're going through the process of, of documenting that and helping that. And at the end of the day, okay, on paper, quote unquote, I got a better result. This is where this is all wrapping up in case in case you're wondering, um, than, than Rachel did with hers. Okay, I got more reviews, um, you know, better ranking, more sales, stuff like that. Okay, it doesn't mean she did anything wrong. It doesn't mean I did anything right. We just did different things. But the cool thing is, because I'm keeping that relationship open and not being a douche, right, then I can benefit from what she learned and she can benefit from what I learned. And hopefully we can benefit together. So there you go. There's your little sitcom as the world turns updates. So let's talk about what I want to talk about this week, and that is opportunity costs. Now, you may be thinking, oh, this is about as exciting as watching paint dry, okay? And I can understand that sentiment uh, because I, for a long time, I did not understand opportunity costs like I understand it today. And I don't care if you work for someone else. This will help you help them and hopefully in, in the end make more money, help yourself or, or work for yourself. This is something that you got to understand. And again, this is something that has become more prevalent in my business and I'm starting to understand it more and more. And now I'm starting to understand things that a few years ago I didn't understand. Do you understand what I just said? Of course not. It's the most confusing thing ever. Let me, let me get this uh, straight and let me straighten this out for you by sharing what I mean. So a few years ago, right, when I was uh, back being a part of the Practical Nimrods team, um, you know, I was friendly with, uh, with Jason Fladlin. And I like Jason. I owe a ton of my beginning to Jason Fladlin. It was his product creation course that got me started in this crazy world. Um, so all roads initially, and for a good deal of time, uh, led from him. So... There's my full public admission, right? Cite the source. One of the things that frustrated me about Jason is that I would always go out of my way, I felt, to actively promote him. And then when I would come along and need some help, he would decline. I understand why he declined now. I did not then, okay? And as I talked about Haterade before, there was a lot set his way. Some of it justified in my mind, I'm sure, some of it unjustified. But here's what I discovered, right? And I actually discovered this doing it uh, myself. And it involves the creativity checklist. So let me explain. All right. I have taught the creativity checklist really three different times. Okay. The first time I did it was part of a tripwire training or a one-off $67 training. And it was one little module in there. It was a little side um, street, if you will. And I, you know, gave it to him in 20 minutes and bam, there you go. People seem to really dig that. So I said, you know what? I'm, and that product, by the way, let's just say that product made us five figures because it did. That's what we'd say. So then I said, well, man, you know what I want to do is I want to take that little tripwire or a piece of the tripwire, the creativity checklist, and I want to turn it into its own product. So I make a little mind map. I record a 30-minute video. I get a PDF, which is just the mind map. I, I do some other stuff. We put a little $9 product together. We sell that make another few thousand dollars. And then this past week, we released it on Amazon. When we do, it becomes a bestseller. And who knows how much money that will make. I, I think we've made 300 bucks to date. You know, if things continue, it could produce a few hundred to a few thousand dollars per year. But let's talk about this for a second. Because the reason I did it like that was for strategery, as my friend Frank Kern likes to say. Okay, And that is, I took the highest return on investment possible first so I could get the most for the opportunity cost. What I mean is this. I had to do the same amount of work 
to sell the $67 training as I did the $9 training as I did the $299 Amazon book. I had to send the same number of emails, maybe in some cases more, okay? I had to get the same number of unsubscribes and upset people that are like, oh my God, Tim Castleman's a spammer because all he does is try to sell us stuff to improve our lives. I had to do the same freaking amount of work. Well, back in the day, when Jason and I were on different levels, right? He was selling $200 products. I was selling $9 products. What I didn't understand then that I do now is what he was giving up wasn't the money, okay? It wasn't that he was making $9 per sale, is that he was losing $191 per sale for every cheaper item that he sold. Let me see if I can clear this up for you a little bit. Let's say you want to make $40,000 a month, okay? Well, you got 30 days to do so. So in order to do that, you have to look for the things that have the highest opportunity cost, okay? Or the highest return on your investment first. For instance, I'll just let you get a little inside peek of my business, okay? We set a financial goal this month right, of doing 30 or 40K, the first week we send two emails out and bam, we hit it out the park, we sell out this offer, we make four figures instantly, right, effortlessly and with very little cost to do. Let's just say, let's just say hypothetically we made 6K, okay, and out of, after everything's said and done, we'll keep about four of that. That's not bad. I'll take that, $4,000, two emails, bam. The next week, we mail out, right, the, the creativity checklist, which you can buy for $9.95 on creativitychecklist.com. You know, you can get the book on Amazon, but we sent an email out for that. We sent twice the amount of emails, and at the end of it, we sold like 150 copies of the creativity checklist, but guess what? Guess what happened? We only made $2,000. Now look, if I set a goal for $40,000 and we do some simple math, I'm at 8K. Well, why am I at 8K? Because I'm not mailing for stuff that has the best return on investment. See, I gotta mail just as hard for a $9 product as I do a $497 product. In fact, I will tell you this, I made easier sales on the 497 than I did the $9 one when it comes to number of mail outs, number of unsubscribes, et cetera, et cetera. And then after I get done doing that, guess what I do? I decide, oh, you know what? That video is not good enough. I want to write a book. So I write a book on the creativity checklist. I wrote 8,000 words in four hours. Bam, it was done. It was great. It was up on Amazon within three days. Within seven days, we had a bestseller. How'd I do that? I mailed my list. Well, every time I mail my list, okay, if I, let's, let's just do easy math, okay? If I want to make $30,000 and I email my list one time a day for 30 days, that means every email is worth three or is worth $1,000. So the three days I spent mailing about my book that was at 99 cents, by the way, at the time, which means we got a whopping 35 cents for each sale. Every time I did that, what was I doing? Well, I was giving up the opportunity to make at least $3,000. Does that make sense? And here's the thing, like we all think that we have this infinite amount of time and money and resources and the fact of the matter is that we don't. And what we need to start doing is really limiting our time and reducing our opportunities as far as you know, when we set a goal of a financial goal, how's the quickest, fastest way that we can do that with the least amount of steps, okay? If I'm trying to make a half million this year, okay, if I'm trying to make a half million dollars this year, it's a lot easier to do that with $1,000 products than it is with $9 products. I've tried to make a good living selling $9 products. It is possible, but you will get burnt out very, very quickly. Because there's just no meat on the bone. 
there's just no meat on the bone. When you get it, you're like, oh, I got $9. You're like, all right, well, take the PayPal fees, right? The JVZoo fees or whoever's fees. Now I'm really left with like $8. Okay, great. Uh, let's see, the sales letter cost me how much? The graphics cost me this much. The support staff to get that stuff up and answer emails. The email list. I mean, when you think about it, there's just no money to do that. And that's the other reason why you have to pay attention to your opportunity cost. My business is expensive. Now, it could be much cheaper, but I like to have U.S. born, U.S. speaking, U.S. residents on my staff. That costs a little bit of money. I like to have people that write and speak and understand English write my sales letter, do my design work. Sure, I could go to little Cluck Cluck Village and, you know, own an island off the coast of the Philippines for a few things, but I don't want to do that. I know a lot of people that do it successfully good for them. That's not something that I desire at this point in my business. Instead, what I would prefer to do, okay, what I would prefer to do is employ, you know, people that require a higher wage but give a higher level of customer satisfaction. Well, I can't do that in $9 WSO world. I can't do that in $17 world. I can do it at 67 and 97 and 197 and 497. I can totally do that, but I can't do it, okay? I can't do it for $9. And I think what people do is, and I, I almost did this. I mean, again, you know, I'm just telling you the truth. Like, here's what I did. So we, we do this best-selling book, right? This nonfiction book, I write it. I write 2,000 words an hour. One, okay, I write a book in less than 24 hours. Two, right, I use a nonfiction writing formula that makes it super easy to write this book. Three, and I start thinking, hmm, you know what I could do is I could make a $7 or $10 product and how I did 2,000 words per, per hour. That's awesome. I could do another product on, on the nonfiction writing formula. That's cool. I can do another one on this. And I started thinking of all these small little things I could do. I said, man, that's a, a lot of work. I got to get three sales letters. I got to get three sales pages. I can do three times that. Or, or instead, I could simply decide to find the highest value and the biggest return on investment possible. And when I do that, then, 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 I'll be able to make the most money possible and get the best return on my investment. So instead of going that route, now I'm thinking of a mega package, which I don't really want to discuss too much on here because, you know, the people that don't understand internet marketing are dozing off and driving into the freeway oncoming traffic. But my point is I switched the opportunity and I looked at the opportunity cost. And the great thing about knowing what it cost you per day to run your business, what you need per day to make the financial goal is, it allows saying no a lot easier, right? Someone comes to me and they go, hey, Tim, look, I got this $9 product. And I go, no, just back in the day, like Jason used to do to me, I would get upset because I didn't understand it. Had Jason pulled me aside and said, Tim, listen, man, I have a huge staff and we need to make $50,000 per month, which means I need to make an average of, you know, $1,250 a day. Listen, I can typically send this many clicks. This is, you know, a 10% conversion is kind of to be expected from my list, yada, yada, yada. Then financially, it would have made a lot more sense. Okay, it's just like when someone goes, hey, Tim, listen, man, I want you to mail um, mail your list and get. I'll give you 35% of $9.95. And I think to myself, let's see, every person on my list is worth $27.84 and you want me to give it to you for $6. That math doesn't work. So knowing your numbers allows you to understand the opportunity cost and understand the cost of not doing something. So I mentioned earlier about the whole, we made a book, a bestseller, which we did, and I wrote it and all that stuff. Well, it would appear, okay, that that was a bad use of opportunity because I mailed out three times and I missed all this immediate income and, you know, this happened and that happened. Uh, so it would appear that maybe I didn't do the best job. Well, let's look at the longer game or the bigger picture. You see, because I did that, now I am a legitimate uh, Amazon bestseller in the nonfiction category. And now I can continue to do that because I have a system and a formula worked out to how I can reproduce that result pretty much at will when I want every couple of weeks, right? 
And as long as that system works out, then eventually I'll be able to go to people and say, hey, let me show you this system. Let me show you what I did, how I did it. Would you like to do the same? So while I may be giving up an immediate income benefit, the long-term benefit of doing what I did will make sense. Just like with this podcast, I envision there will be a podcast push eventually to my list where I will be like, hey, guys, you know, go review it, go download it, go listen to it. And my goal will not be immediate benefit, but long term benefit of doing something like that. And the best thing I can tell you, and it happened to me last year briefly, and then I forgot about it. And I was reminded about it this month. You know, if you want to get out of mailing for cheap products, there's a very simple solution to it. And that is mail for an expensive one, right? Find an expensive product you want to promote or a service you want to get behind, bonus the shit out of it with good stuff that'll make it really good, and then get, get mail on it, watch the conversions, and as long as it converts well, I guarantee you it is much harder to send for a $9 offer after mailing for a $4.95 offer. It's a natural thing. You're like, I want to make more money. Like, I want to make 6000 in a weekend instead of 2000 or no 1000 Because there's nothing worse than working all freaking week than when you pay out your copywriters, your support staff, your designers, your affiliates being like, how much money did I make this week? It's like, negative uh, $10, Tim. It's like, that's not good. That's not good at all. And the other thing I'll tell you is this, right? By, by limiting your opportunities, okay, as, as I'm defining them, it allows you to focus more on one thing. For instance, a lot of people make this mistake of promoting 50 things at one time, right? It's like, hey, next great, next great, next great. Every, every day is something better, bigger, faster, stronger, more awesomer than before, right? Because I'm sure awesomer is a word. The problem with that is people get tired of hearing about that very quickly because it's like dude all you're doing is just selling me the next big thing and if you want a real world application go look at AppSumo those guys used to do a new offer every week or every it was like every day it was a different thing they were like her emailing machines they were just amazingly talented at burning out their list and losing their following well I used to do that and I found the same thing. People unsubscribe, they don't listen to you, they're like, stop selling me shit, you know, help me out more, quit quit always trying to get my wallet. Well, here's the cool thing about doing it when differently when you limit your opportunity. You can really go in depth with a project or a product. You can show them several different angles or hooks or ways they can use it and if you have enough time and desire, you can bonus it effectively to make it to where they implement it better, where they get a better result. And as a result of that, because they spent the money, they're willing to put in the work. Because someone that, that spends $200 on something is a hell of a lot more committed than somebody that spends $2 on something. Plus, you can provide them with a better level of service, okay, a better customer experience, and the fact that you're actually making money allows you not to have to hammer them with 15, 16, 1300 different offers a month, and instead, you can just do two to four to six, however many offers you want, but do them at a high, high quality level. So the thing I would do if I was trying to figure this out, okay? If you're just getting started, make an income amount that you want to make, right? I want to make $10,000 because that's what everybody says. Then divide that over the number of days you plan on emailing, whether it's once a day, once a week, whatever. And then that will give you the number that you need to hit. So if you're going to mail three times a week, okay? That means you've got 10 mailing opportunities. If you're trying to make $10,000, that means every single email you send out has to make you an average of a thousand bucks. And because you know that, then you can look at it and go, okay, what's going to give me the best opportunity for my involvement in my time? If you learn this much quicker than I did, you will see much, you'll see much better rewards much faster. Right, And it will also help you understand why some people have to say no thank you and pass on the opportunity to promote you. And I will tell you, okay, um, one thing that happened this past week, and you know, and I'm not trying to brag, I'm just trying to share with you. I, I got confirmation from my accountant. We have beaten 
all of our 2013 sales. So we have sold more products than we did in 2013. We've made more gross and net sales and profit as a result. One of the big things I did, and it was so simple, but I, I neglected it for a long time. Luckily, I'm a smart learner, so I'm going to do it again here in a little bit was I raised my prices. A simple act of going from nine to $17 produces a tremendous windfall when you're selling thousands upon thousands of units. And that's an $8 increase. If you sell a thousand units, that's an extra $8,000 you put in your pocket if you do it right. And there's a lot of other changes that have resulted in that. And I'll cover that in podcast in the future. But today, I just kind of wanted to share with you and give you an update on what happened with Hater Aid Part 2 and how I was able to kind of get that resolved or, or work on a, a better resolution. And two, talk about an important lesson that I learned when it comes to opportunity cost and understanding the cost of running your business and the opportunity cost and how you should always be striving to sell more, better products at a higher price and increasing your bottom line while giving your customers a tremendous experience, a ton of support, and at the same time, enriching the lives of those that you work with. In fact, uh, I guess I'll make it public now. Uh, the wonderful and talented and amazing Paula Steen is going part-time with us. For those of you guys who know Paula, um, you know what a tremendous uh, uh, and amazing woman she is. I will openly and honestly say I don't believe my business would still be around if she hadn't come into my life. And there is just one problem uh, with Paula, and that is she has become a mini mogul herself. She is uh, the t-shirt queen of Florida and just doing amazingly well. And surprisingly, when you are making a really, really ridiculously great income selling t-shirts, it makes it a little harder to get up and do the nine to five because the opportunity cost of doing what she does for herself outweighs, far outweighs what I'm able to do for her. So to be an amazing and talented woman as she is, she has agreed to stay on part-time to make sure that I keep saying and, uh, don't, uh, don't do anything too drastic. Um, so she will be leaving the company or at least reducing down to part-time. You shouldn't notice uh, an immediate impact. You shouldn't notice an impact at all. In fact, I have uh, the wonderful and lovely and talented Bethany who is joining the team and has been with us behind the scenes for about the past month. And you guys will be hearing more about her as things come to be. Um, but um, yeah, if you would do me a favor, and if you've ever interacted with the amazing and talented Paula, if you would uh, jump on Facebook and wish her well in her new endeavors. She's not leaving the company completely. Uh, she's just going to, you know, work on her fifth dream home of the year. So with that, I'm done. I appreciate you listening. I thank you so much for your awesome and kind comments. I also uh, got a bottle here of Ray and Nephew White Overproof Rum. This stuff, I, I had a swig of it. Uh, this is grain alcohol. I don't even want to know. I don't even want to know the proof. The proof that this must be is got to be ridiculously well. So I made the mistake of just taking a sip of it by itself. When I regained consciousness, I mixed it with some Coke and some ice. Um, and I yes, yes, I promise I will sit down to pee for the rest of the week for, for creating that great offense. Uh, it literally melted the ice in three seconds. So I'm very concerned about what I'm drinking, but it's very, very delicious. And I'm entirely grateful uh, whenever you guys send me some amazing and awesome gifts like that. So I want to uh, take a special second and, uh, and thank Jason Strachan. I probably screwed that last name up, Jason. It's not my fault that you have a difficult name and that I can't pronounce syllables apparently. So uh, Jason, thanks so much uh, for the gift. Thank you guys for your awesome and continuing feedback. I promise uh, to continue doing it. And I look forward to doing it again in just a few short days. So with that, have a great week. Be well. Talk to you soon.